Hi, and welcome to another Access Chat. I'm really excited today because we've got Axel Lebois from G3 ICT with us, and we're talking about how we can take uh, accessibility and inclusion international. Axel's organization work uh, across borders, and, and I'm really excited that, that we have someone that uh, is working uh, in, in lots of areas that, that we're interested in, that we currently talked about, and um, that has knowledge of not only working with the United Nations, but also a background in large enterprise, which is the space that Antonio and I are working in. Um, so it has a lot of perspectives that I think would be of real interest to people, um, particularly some of our viewers. So welcome, Axel, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, my pleasure, really. I'm very happy to be part of the discussion here. Excellent. So um, I, I, I know Deborah um, has known you for quite some time, um, and, and obviously I've, I've been aware of, of G3ICT, but can you give us a little bit of background about your organization and, and what it was that motivated you to, to, to mm -hmm. start this? Sure. Well, you've got to go back to the year 2006, uh, which is when the text of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was uh, finally adopted by the United Nations General Assembly <clears throat> so that it could become uh, an international treaty after it's being signed and ratified by countries. And um, uh, back then, uh, different uh, leaders of the committee that um, actually wrote the text of the Convention uh, were a bit concerned that some of the most innovative uh, article of the convention may actually be lost uh, as the convention was, uh, you know, promoted uh, later on. And uh, among those articles, uh, they felt that Article 9, that for the first time established ICT accessibility on par with ICT, uh, sorry, with accessible transportation and the built environment, uh, would be, uh, you know, either not uh, perceived as important or maybe not understood. Uh, because uh, when you read the text of the convention, uh, what's happening now is that because of the definition of accessibility incorporating ICTs, technically it's becoming as compulsory everywhere to have an accessible website or accessible app or accessible phone or accessible ATM or accessible any digital interface as it is to have a ramp on a building or an accessible uh, bus. So uh, essentially it puts an enormous uh, load of obligation on countries which have ratified the, the CRPD. And unless uh, governments which are responsible for implementation understand the scope of Article 9 and even more what solution exists to make this happen, then uh, progress may be very slow to come. So at the time, the uh, UN DESA, which is the United Nations uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs, which oversees, uh, actually did oversee the whole negotiation process for the convention, uh, suggested that uh, uh, an initiative be formed by volunteers uh, regrouping industry, persons with disabilities, and the public sector to actually raise awareness about the convention in Article 9, uh, make sure that uh, governments will understand the scope of it, uh, also uh, promote solutions, promote innovation, promote standardization and harmonization, make sure that, uh, you know, that whole uh, domain of ICT accessibility be dreamt as much as possible around the world. So that's why we started this ICT uh, with both uh, support from uh, the UN agency, but also from multi-stakeholders, essentially persons with disabilities, uh, leading IT industry firms, and uh, you know, a lot of different public sector agencies. Excellent. I, I, and I think that you're absolutely spot on in, in your um, analysis that if, if people, people and organizations and countries and politicians often sign up for things that they don't really understand, they don't really look at the detail, uh, and, and therefore absolutely it's important to proselytize and, and, and get the information out there. Um, I'm really interested as to what your personal motivation was to, to get you involved in, in, in this enterprise because you, you come from um, background in the IT industry 
what first drew your attention to, to uh, and your interest in, in accessibility and accessible ICT? Well, uh, first of all, as you just mentioned, I spent my whole life in the information technology industry and, and certainly uh, was fortunate to run an organization with a large uh, global uh, footprint. And so uh, I really had the chance to participate for many years uh, in the process of opening a lot of new markets, new countries, new ways of using technology and, and you know, the, the spread of information technology in the 80s and the 90s and then in the early 2000s has been unbelievable. Uh, yet, uh, when you look at the picture today, uh, there is still one frontier that needs to be uh, kind of uh, reached and overcome, and that is the frontier of persons who cannot use technology or digital interfaces because of lack of accessibility of those interfaces and their particular uh, disability situation. So uh, uh, that was uh, uh, kind of a professional consideration when I kind of retired from the computer industry. I thought it would be a terrific uh, topic to promote. Uh, furthermore, uh, from a personal standpoint, as many people who are involved in uh, accessibility, I did have uh, personal situations in my own family where I could see the best of uh, technology, uh, but also the worst in that uh, I could see how assistive technologies can change someone's life, like 180 degrees, but I could also see that inaccessible content, inaccessible software and user interface can shed, shed out someone from uh, regular work and access to cultural information and everything. So I think those experiences were very close to me. I, I, they really motivated me to, uh, to get involved. Uh, also, I felt uh, very much that uh, the United Nations uh, having taken the initiative with the CRPD was a terrific uh, framework to, to promote accessibility. Uh, I am an internationalist by heart, so it fitted me very well, and I was happy to uh, be there at the right time. <laughs> yes, that's a fantastic answer, and I, 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 I too am an internationalist, and, and I, I'm, I'm not going to hold the limelight because I know Deborah will have some questions too. But I do have um, one one further topic, and and that is around how how do we take this, this initiative forward? And I think it has to be around internationalization because I, IT companies and IT and technology spans the globe. So um, the approach has to be global, to my mind, um, in, in terms of how we um, push forward adoption. But how do, how do you see your organization helping foster that adoption and, and how, how do you reach out to the, the people in, in government and the decision makers to help progress that? So thank you for the, for the question. You know, uh, the, the scope of, of our mission is uh, in one hand extra, extraordinarily large and difficult, on the other hand it is simpler than what it seems. And let, so let me give you a few answers to your question. First of all, on the need for a globalized modernization, uh, it is crucial because, as we know from industry experience, harmonization and standardization leads to uh, mass production, greater competition, more innovation, and also huge economies of scale. Uh, just to, again, as an example, you know, microelectronics components of the mobile phone industry the reason why you have such an extraordinary device now for a few hundred dollars in your hand is because the same device is used everywhere from China to Argentina, Europe, or the US. And so the ability to keep accessible and assistive technologies in the mold of global harmonization is really crucial also for interoperability between different technologies. So I totally agree with you. Uh, if there is any area where harmonization and globalization of uh, standardization are crucial. That is the actual uh, use of assistive and accessible uh, technologies for, for persons with disabilities. Now, uh, how do you influence that whole thing uh, is, is, of course, a key challenge. First of all, um, there are standard development organizations such as ISO and, of course, the regional organization like CEN or CTELEC in Europe, because I guess you are sitting in Europe right now, but yeah. also 
Uh, you have, uh, you know, folks uh, in the U.S. doing the same thing. Uh, and virtually in every big country where you have uh, industry presence, you have chapters of those uh, standardization bodies. So uh, to the extent that the convention mandates state parties to adopt standards for accessibility, there is no question that they have got to be involved. So very early on in 2008, we organized a fairly large meeting in Geneva with, with all those standard development organizations. And for an entire day in Geneva, we actually mapped the CRPD obligation on one hand and uh, what was the work plan of the different uh, standard development organizations, including ITU, ISO, CEN, and others. And that was really a very interesting kickoff to the process uh, of integrating accessibility consideration among those organizations. And certainly both ISO and ITU have done tremendous work in that space. And, uh, you know, it's not visible from the public, but it's really, really important. Uh, also, ISO has developed, uh, you know, a definition of human factor and accessibility and all those domains of activity are very important. We also have been promoted web accessibility standard with the WCAG and uh, now an ISO standard as well, or DAISY consortium, uh, you know, uh, standard. All of those standards are crucial because the more you can unify uh, the global marketplace around accessible technologies, the better. Now, at the country level, it is kind of complicated because you have different topics to deal with. Uh, first, um, there is what in each country what we call the information infrastructure, which will be uh, a few service providers delivering services to millions of people. So, for instance, the broadcasters for television, uh, the mobile service providers for mobile telephony, or the traditional telephony, or the big banks with ATMs all over the country. Those are major pieces of information infrastructure that are controlled by very few companies in each country and that are regulated. So therefore, if you can actually talk to both the regulator and those companies together with organizations of persons with disabilities in countries, you can achieve change. Uh, I would not say in an easy fashion, but at least you can put all the decision makers around a very small table. So it is not complicated if there is a political will to do it. Uh, now, how do we do that? We, we actually partner uh, in that particular case since almost inception with the International Telecommunication Union. And why we do this is because uh, in the UN system, each of the UN agencies have a particular government focus. So for instance, the ITU would be the organization of the UN, which regroups every single telecom regulator in the world. And almost every single broadcaster regulator, broadcasting regulator in the world. So by partnering with the ITU, uh, in developing content and toolkits for policymakers and technical reports and speaking at some major ITU meetings with all the regulators present, I think we contributed quite a bit to get uh, the ITU membership to be much more aware of accessibility opportunities. And I think the ITU loved it. We loved it because the ITU gives us tremendous support in helping us access those decision makers. And I think we do help ITU quite a bit by providing a lot of uh, in-kind support in content and expertise from around the world on accessibility. Uh, another domain which is really important is content and services. So those are uh, content that can be provided by anyone around the, uh, the, the economy, the social sphere, and uh, education, and uh, uh, e-commerce website, and everybody does produces content. And there, if the content, as you know, is not accessible, you have a big problem. So on this particular angle, we, we, we started by addressing the education market. And uh, Deborah know that because she has been one of our uh, champions overseas, uh, delivering uh, seminars in remote places such as Egypt lately. Uh, and um, we produce with UNESCO um, a joint model policy for uh, inclusive ICTs in education. The same way we did model policies with ITU for mobile telephony, for public, public access points, for uh, uh, public procurement, for television, and so on and so forth. So I think we have developed for each country you know, who is interested, we have a whole series of technical reports 
and also model policies to address those, those issues. But finally, there is a last segment which is really important. So the first being information infrastructure, the second being content and services, and the third one is the promotion of assistive technologies in the country. And that uh, is a different ball game because there you are talking about providing um, uh, support to persuade those abilities to learn how to use assistive technologies and to ensure that assistive technologies are available to persuade those abilities. And so in that space, uh, most often you see in each country, the Ministry of Education with special educators as one of the major channels for that. Uh, you also see uh, rehab centers, which typically re report to the Ministry of Health. And then the third one is the workplace accommodation channel where you see employers trying to accommodate their employees. And that will be most often under the uh, jurisdiction of the Ministry of Labor. So in each country, when you talk about assistive technology, you have got to look at those, what we would say in the private sector, you know, yes. the channels, distribution channels and support ecosystem have to be aligned with those different domains. And that is the most difficult thing in many countries even if you gave away the assistive technology, there is just not the local expertise to support persons with disabilities. So there, the human resource gap is considerable and uh, any effort that can be made to develop a greater, better organized support ecosystem for assistive technologies is, is a crucial step for, for CRPD uh, state parties. So that's what we do. We, we work with UN agencies, essentially in a nutshell, to reach out to the appropriate level of government when we are in country, we work in very closely with the uh, uh, local disabled person organizations. And uh, most often we are able to attract leading private sector participants in our local meetings because the other parties are present anyway. So they want to be a participant. I must say that whatever is the regime, uh, you know, uh, the nature of the country, the nature of the regime, uh, we seldom see any uh, parties opposing our uh, effort to the contrary. We see a lot of support, uh, you know, from, and Deborah, I see Deborah as saying, yes, you know, we, we operate in countries as diverse as China, uh, Egypt, Russia, South Africa, Mexico, Brazil, and so on and so forth. So everywhere we get tremendous support and, and in many cases, the local government agencies responsible for CRPD implementation are just very eager to, to do jointly, uh, to do our stuff jointly with, with, with us. So uh, it, it, it is a great, uh, it is a great time to be involved in that space. It's, uh, it's coming up. It sounds very exciting, actually. Um, it is. Devin, <laughs> do, you have, do you have some questions? For you? Well, you know, yeah, yeah. One, thing that, one thing that I thought that Excel has taught me because um, I'm very proud to have Excel as a mentor. I think he's got a lot of mentees under his belt. But um, one thing that Excel taught me that I thought was very important, and I've had a lot of people ask me about this, and I, did, I thought it would be helpful for you to address it, Excel, is um, sometimes when we're dealing with the multinational corporations that really do want to embrace this, but are so confused on how to do it. I think um, one thing that Excel had told me was the one of the really important things that the CRPD brought to the table was it defined, you know, what do we mean by disabilities? What do we mean by assistive technology? What, and so it, that was something that is important to all of us, but I was wondering, Excel, if you would talk about that from the perspective of a lot of the corporations, the multinational corporations that are supporting not only G3ICT and UNCRPT, CRPD, but you know they, they're really supporting these issues all over the world. Yes, yeah, certainly. So uh, I do have a uh, uh, complete agreement with you, Deborah, on the on the fact that the CRPD is actually a terrific framework. Uh, for all larger, large organizations and government to understand what that means. And seldom a treaty has been as clear as the CRPD. And let me say here that the reason why the CRPD is so effective is because it was negotiated in large part with organizations of personal disabilities from around the world, even though some were not present physically at the UN. This was the first international treaty that was negotiated with email input 
from organizations from around the world who were actually the very people that the convention was supposed to protect. So the reason why the language is so precise, so practical, and so well actually laid out is that it was written by persons with disabilities for, the, for, for a large part. And so the, the convention itself does offer a very clear definition for what is disability uh, and you know what it means to actually address barriers uh, to, to access. And one of the major uh, kind of innovation of the convention, which was, was trying to adopt, to completely adopt the, the social perspective on, on, on disability, which is the disability is a result of the interaction between the impairment of someone and the lack of uh, ability of society to address ways to uh, you know, uh, take out the accessibility barrier. So disability is a shared kind of issue between the environment and the person. And so it puts the load of uh, you know, accessibility on everyone, every single organization, every single government has to look at it this way. So, um, but to, to respond to you uh, more directly uh, about large corporations, um, the reason why from inception, uh, IBM, Microsoft, Google, and others, and Adobe, and many large uh, AT&T, and Verizon, and T-Mobile, and others have supported us, uh, is certainly not uh, out of uh, uh, just a pure nice thing to do, or nice thing to support, it's because Strategically, uh, the largest IT corporation in the world see it as a must uh, for their own uh, well-being. Uh, see, the, the, the issue that we have here is that uh, in many countries where the population is aging, uh, if companies are not able or in a position to actually offer fully accessible services, they are losing a fairly significant marketplace. In the US alone, there are 54 million persons with disabilities out of which 37 million are with severe disabilities. That is a US census statistic. It's not like an out of the cloud and invention. So if you, if you are prepared, especially when you go to higher uh, kind of age brackets, uh, if you are prepared to give up uh, that marketplace of the company, yeah, I mean, you know, just forget about accessibility. But if you think it's really important to, to you know, make sure that you actually cover a significant segment of the population, which actually in many countries happens to control a lot of the wealth and has significant income, then you just pay attention to it. In fact, I know personally several organizations in the US, uh, including in the hotel and, tra and, and travel uh, business, that have totally transformed their website and, and ways of dealing with customer services based on those considerations. So it's not it's not something that I should say uh, is uh, philanthropy uh, for, for corporations. Or it may be, of course, because people like the notion, but it's also a well thought out interest, self-interest. And of course, as g 3 we see ourselves as promoting the rights of persons with disabilities in the digital age. But when we talk to large corporations, we really, really try as much as we can to use the business language to explain what are the merits of having a very strong accessibility policy within the organization? And that is both to employ people with disabilities as well as to address customers with disabilities. So that's, I don't know if that answers your question, but really uh, the CRPD offers a framework that talks about reasonable accommodation, uh, the way to actually uh, promote uh, technology usage by persons with disabilities, it addresses the workplace environment, it addresses education. So it's a very comprehensive uh, framework beyond a legal treaty. It's also, I would say, a roadmap for economic and social development. That's, that's fantastic. And, and, it is fantastic. and you did answer my question because I think, it, um, I think it's important to note that it, it has taken so many different stakeholders to make this happen. I think we may have just lost Axel. Uh, are you here? I can oh. hear you, but I can't. Okay, okay. So we just lost your video. Okay, good. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm, well, I think we're all in in violent agreement here because oh. um, because oh, yeah. it, when, when we when we look at um, yeah, there you are. UK, um, 
the, the access to work, work grant scheme is the only one that generates revenue to, to the Treasury out of all of the grant schemes um, that the government runs. So it's actually revenue positive. Providing this money to help people with disabilities work and, and lead productive lives is, is actually bringing in more tax revenue than, than is being spent in, in the provision. And it's the same paradigm within, within industry. Um, I think that that message still sometimes takes a while to get across um, and, and, and that that's something that we're trying to change, that, that the rationale behind um, us holding these these sort of chats and, and interviewing people and, and, and getting people interested um, and building that kind of groundswell of um, interest and opinion and, and taking the the topic into the language of business because I don't think that that is necessarily done that well or that often. I know you do it and I know that Deborah does it a lot and I spend a lot of my time talking about the, the business case and the business benefits and how that can enable an organization or an organization to be effective and, and, and reach customers but I think that this is still fairly revolutionary within our within our industry if we call it an industry within this this sector um, and that it's something that we, we need to encourage more people to do, to, to step out of the um, disability advocacy uh, arena and the technical accessibility arena and, and start interfacing clearly with gov uh, governments and companies and, and really looking at becoming part of their business as usual processes and their, their normal ways of working. Uh, and, and that's where I think we'll, we'll drive success. But we need more people like yourself and like Deborah to, to, and, and others to, to do that. And one more good point to um, Excel. What, the reason why we created Access Chat, and it was the brainchild of Neil and Antonio, and then they invited me since I'm so um, it's, it's all over social media. But we wanted to take the really amazing work that is being done from organizations like G3ICT, and we sort of wanted to bring it onto the social media um, platform so that we could bring in even more users that we aren't necessarily seeing in the conversations. So we thought it was really important to create Access Chat, and, and we, were really, we really are very grateful for you taking your time to join us on it, Excel, because we just think it's opening up channels that um, for more people with disabilities and more voices to come in and broaden the topic. And that's why we chose to do our access chat. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed the opportunity. <laughs> thank you once again. Yeah, we, we really, really appreciate your time, Excel. And we, um, we look forward to the Twitter chat later with uh, G3ICT and with everybody else. And um, we just appreciate you supporting us and everything else that you've done too to make a difference because you definitely made a huge difference. Let me know. Thank let you. me uh, conclude by saying that uh, I would welcome your participation in the M Enabling Summit where you could be a great addition to the social, social media activity. Uh, that is June 1st and 2nd in Washington, D.C. We expect about 600 folks coming from around the world to discuss exclusively all the innovation in mobile accessibility and assistive solutions. Well, we, we, we would love... And I never miss it. Yeah, love... I never miss it. It's the best one. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah, so, so we Sorry. will find a way of supporting that via social media, via presence. One way or another, we will definitely support it. Um, I, I love mobile. Mobile is the future of, of accessibility because everybody's got one. It's, right, exactly. And you should come and be on site to do the uh, uh, whole, uh, you know, chatting exercise. Okay, okay. That's, that sounds very yeah. interesting. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> right. we, could interview, we could interview all kind of leaders. It's no, no, creativity, yeah. Summit. yeah. 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 Absolutely. All okay. right. All right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks. So thank, thank you, so you much. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I'm, and I will be closing down the conversation. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thanks. Thank